Das darf doch nicht wahr sein. Ist. Was? So viele alte Kameraden heute Abend hier. Raus, raus, Männer, raus. Deutschland, die Deutschen, aus Männer, raus. I wanted to show that not all Jews things the same, like the German government would like to portray, but I, I wasn't able. The policemen came directly to me and they told me that it's forbidden to do what I'm doing. At some point they saw that I was insisting on that, so they took me in custody to the police uh, car. They took also my ID. They told me that it's forbidden to have pro-Palestinian uh, demonstrations there. The result of the collective guilt the formal disavowal of everything that they had done in the 1930s and 40s with the fact that they never had a proper conversation about what led to Nazism and what was Nazism really. And it wasn't just some cult that took off and, you know, it wasn't some weed that they smoked and then they all went crazy for 10 years and then they recovered. Yeah, there, was, there were other things happening for a very long time there. Uh, so this combination the incomplete denazification, the incomplete discussion, and the collective guilt has led the vast majority of Germans to uh, swap their racist nationalism for ultra-Zionism. Ultra that was Yanis Varoufakis, Greece's former finance minister who was banned from entering Germany because he was one of the organizers of the Palestine Congress in Berlin. I want to repeat that. A man who is an EU citizen was banned from entering Germany because he's speaking up for Palestine. Yes, that actually happened. Let that sink in for a minute because we're going to return to Yanis later when we talk about the Palestine Congress, also with a special guest, an activist from Dresden. We're going to get into all of that. But for now, I want to talk about Iris Hefetz, the woman who was also in the opening montage clip, because she's one of the members of a Jewish organization called Jewish Voice for Just Peace in Germany, which is one of the organizations behind the Palestine Congress in Berlin. And I got also um, a police um, complaint because of hate speech. And I said, what is here hate speech? And the only answer I got, we don't know. We get our orders from above. The German. Nice, nice thing to hear in Germany, yeah. So let's break this down. Germany in 2024 is still persecuting critical thinking Jews for their ideas. Does that remind you of another time in Germany's history? The irony here is that Germany thinks it's moved on from its past. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> in Germany's desperate attempt to run from the past, they forgot to investigate the past and why it happened. They naively think that their blind support of Israel will somehow erase that memory of what they once were. But if you're silencing people in this brutal way, arresting people for speaking, for thinking, how are you different? That was a rhetorical question, by the way, <laughs> because you're not different. But it's almost comical how they don't see it. I had a great career in Germany for 25 years. I had my own TV show. I won all the TV awards. I had huge sellout crowds and I met very important people. And then I made one joke about Israel. Speaking of unintentional comedy, let's talk about the Berlinale, the Berlin Film Festival, which happened in February. I kid you not, this actually happened. The film that won Best Documentary, No Other Land, which was co-directed by an Israeli and a Palestinian, and it was about the apartheid, about how horrible life is under the occupation. And the two filmmakers got up there to accept the award, and they both gave speeches, moving speeches, and then they got a round of applause. It's our first movie since many years very hard for me to celebrate when there are tens of thousands of my people being slaughtered and massacred by israel in gaza i ask one thing for germany as i am in berlin here to respect the u.n calls and stop sending weapons to israel i want to say we are we are standing in front of you now me and basel are the same age i am israeli basel is palestinian and in two days, we will go back to a land where we are not equal. I'm living under a civilian law, and Basel is under military law. We need to call for a political solution to end the occupation. 
And then the next day, Claudia Roth, Germany's Federal Commissioner for Culture, was attacked for clapping. And she literally said, I wasn't clapping for the Palestinian. I was only clapping for the Israeli. And she thought that's okay to say. The irony is that the Israeli filmmaker, in the very speech of acceptance, he talked about the inequality, which was also the subject of the film. <laughs> but she was under so much pressure, of course. This is just not up to her. Like a delegate for the Christian Democratic Union called for her resignation. And speaking of conservative Christian Germans who want to absolve themselves of the guilt over the Holocaust, there is a professor at the Catholic University of Rhine. He was recently giving a lecture called Loneliness of Israel, and he finishes it off by saying, and we're going to talk about the Muslim Brotherhood. Dieser weit verbreitete Antisemitismus in den islamischen und arabischen Gesellschaften ist ein zentraler Grund dafür, dass es diesen Konflikt in der Form überhaupt gibt, wie es ihn heute gibt. Allein historisch in der Chronologie sieht man deutlich, dass der Antisemitismus der Gründung Israels vorausgeht. Wir werden viel über die Muslimbrüderschaft hören. Let's talk about you, babe. Yeah? And I hate to bring up religion and make this a religious thing, but you seem to be. So if we're going to make it about which religion hated Jews, it's not the Muslims, babe. And antisemitism did indeed come before, but it didn't start with the Muslim Brotherhood. So let's not point fingers. Yeah? But let's go back to how Germany is still silencing Jews while pretending to fight anti-Semitism, especially when those Jewish voices are trying to speak up against Israel. There's an American author, Nathan Thrall, who wrote a beautiful book called A Day in the Life of Abed Salame, which was about a tragic bus accident in which Abed Salame lost his son, his five-year-old son, and that bus crash happened on a very poorly maintained road in the West Bank, an occupied West Bank, and because the road is so poorly maintained, no one could reach it, the bus was set on fire and the kids died in it. You have to read this book. You will cry, girl. <laughs> you will cry. And crying is good, by the way, in the face of what's happening. But anyway, Nathan was on tour promoting the book in Germany. In Germany, I had an event that was to take place on Tuesday in Frankfurt that was uh, canceled at the very last minute. And none of the people who canceled the event had read the book or knew a thing about, uh, about it and none of them had or provided any substantive uh, reason for the cancellation. But Germany doesn't just silence Jews. It silences everyone who tries to speak up against Israel. It's equal opportunity fascism, babe. Yeah. Which brings us to another incident involving also authors and books at the Frankfurt Book Fair, where Palestinian author Shelby was supposed to receive an award which was canceled. And then the famous philosopher Zizek addressed the cancellation at the opening ceremony. He said, and this is the statement that got him so much trouble. He literally just said, I'm going to read. There will be no peace in the Middle East without resolving the Palestinian question. One should defend Palestinian rights and fight anti-Semitism. That's it. That's all he said. And here he is talking about the experience a couple of months later. When I said what I said in Frankfurt, the most disgusting thing for me is literally dozens of people, hardline Germans, came to me privately, literally looked around carefully and then whispered into my, you know, basically I agree with you. It's just not the right moment to say it. Yeah. I was accused of politicizing the event, book fair. Oh, this is a pure cultural event, blah, blah. Sorry, before me, there were five speakers from Germany. All of them openly repeated one motive, full unconditional support for Israel. I just added to it, Palestinians are also Suffering, I was accused of politicizing it. The general logic is we did the Holocaust, so now as a dirty deal with Israel, we will say you were our victims, but in exchange we tolerate your crimes today. You know, it's disgusting. And this didn't start today, by the way. Israel has been working Germany for decades. Angela Merkel spricht in Jerusalem als erste Bundeskanzlerin vor der Knesset, dem israelischen Parlament. Merkel stellt mit Blick auf den Holocaust klar. Diese historische Verantwortung Deutschlands ist Teil der Staatsräson meines Landes. Das heißt, die Sicherheit Israels ist für mich als deutsche Bundeskanzlerin niemals verhandelbar. In diesem Moment gibt es für Deutschland nur einen Platz. Den Platz an der Seite Israels. Deutschland steht fest an der Seite Israels. Israel hat nicht nur das Recht, sondern es hat die Pflicht, 
seine Bevölkerung im Rahmen des internationalen Rechtes zu schützen. Jetzt ist die Zeit für das klare und unverrückbare Bekenntnis. Israels Sicherheit ist deutsche Staatsräson. Israel hat unsere uneingeschränkte Solidarität. Luckily, not every German is worshiping at the altar of Israel. Which brings us to the guest of this week. Lovely girl Sophia from Germany. She's a social worker, that's her degree. She's an activist who advocates for the global south. And Palestine more specifically these days, for the obvious reasons. There has never been someone just grabbing the root of German fascism, pulling an array, throwing on the compost and starting all over again. 30 Jahre sind diese Bilder her und sie machen aber heute immer noch genauso fassungslos. Stecken Rechtsextreme, ein Wohnheim für vietnamesische Familien, genannt das Sonnenblumenhaus und die zentrale Aufnahmestelle für Asylbewerber in Brand. Und das teilweise ungehindert von der Polizei. I think that's where the link is between Israeli and German um, politics as well. If you were to look at what Israel is doing right now, they are killing their own pain in Palestinians. They project everything that happened, the deepest victim, victimization one could ever imagine onto the Palestinian people. Lechu v'hargu otam, chichaslu otam, al takshivu l'shum pkuda acheret. Machnisim otchem, kol dabar shezaz, l'harog. להשמיד, להרוג ולאבד. זאת המשימה שלך, חייל צה"ל יקר. עזה הופכת לדרזדן, לדרזדן. And Germans are projecting every guilt, shame, betrayal, every disgust about what has happened unto um, the Palestinians. And I went to a place in Neukölln, which is the place where most Palestinians are living, also because there was a, a very, um, you know, massive until now propaganda that uh, Muslims and Palestinians and Arabs are hating Jews and they are the anti-Semites. So German um, can, you know, uh, evacuate their anti-Semitism and project it on, on Muslims and, you know, stay calm and we are clean. I did not grow up here in Dresden. I grew up in like a suburban um, region and they are disgusted by people that are looking different than themselves. It's deep disgust, it's loathing. They wish that they will just disappear. And that is exactly what some kind of politicians feel it themselves. Let's just call it what it is. There's never been a proper denazification in Germany. The Jews have now simply been swapped for Arabs. And what I loved about the chat with Sophia, what I love about anyone who's able to have some self-introspection, figuring out the reason we are moved is because we have a personal connection to this. And it's very important to note that Sophia is from Dresden, which is where she still lives. So she has a very complicated history with the bombing of Dresden, which by the way, was discussed for a while the same way Gaza is discussed. Was it justified to carpet bomb all those people as you fight the Nazis? So that's what I love about somebody like Sophia, using your own history and your life experiences to understand the other, because we're all really similar. And working on this video has inspired me to dig deep into my own self and figure out the complicated feelings that are under fascism and racism, which includes internalized racism. Because Palestinians, like any minority, we start to internalize the racism that's directed at us. Taking on the ideas of your oppressor, believing that there's something wrong with you. And now, thanks to Gaza, me and millions of people are waking up to all this stuff, all this rot. And when you wake up to the idea that you haven't been asleep, that your dignity was put <laughs> on the bench, you start to experience anger and feel anger. And before I used to be very ashamed of my anger, but now I'm like, come here, girl, come here, let me feel you. And speaking of anger, my lip sync guest for this week is Claire Daly, the member of the European Parliament, because she's not afraid to get in touch with her anger. She's very smart, very sharp, but she's all feeling, all heart. And my favorite thing about her is how she critiques that witch Ursula von der Leyen, that hypocrite president of the European Commission, who was a political disaster at home before she became president of the European Commission. Inept defense minister, corruption scandals, up the wazoo. So this clown is talking about how Israel is a vibrant democracy. Today, we celebrate 75 years of vibrant democracy in the heart of the Middle East. <laughs> Vibrant democracy? Really? They're coiffed here. Girl, you look like Hitler in drag. <laughs> anyway, 
let's leave this person. Is she a person? Yeah, person. Let's leave her and go to Claire Daly. Gaza is the litmus test. It's not only about genocide, it's more than that. Israel is playing the role of the vanguard in the attack on the norms and standards which have existed since World War II. We know, of course, that these were never properly upheld. There were always double standards, one law for our friends, one for everyone else. But now, these standards are earmarked for total demolition. And what we see unfurling here are the rules of a much more unfair, violent world which has been written. This is European values as they really are. The old values of colonialism. The struggle for Gaza, in that sense, is truly the struggle for humanity and international law. Hey y'all, it's In Denial. As I always say, I'm in denial so you can wake up. I'm in denial so Germany can wake up. Because wow, who knows? Quick thank you to all the people who donated on the last couple of videos and all the new members. Love you guys, as always. You're helping me build the empire. Now let's go back to the subject of the video and how deluded Germany is. There is a moment when the UN Special Rapporteur on Palestinian Occupied Territory, Francesca Albanese, was presenting her report on how this is a genocide. And a German journalist thought to ask her, thought it's okay to act, uh, you know what? I'll just let him speak for himself. I'd like to ask you on the intent of the uh, Israeli government or Israeli militaries uh, to uh, commit genocide. You were saying that there is intent um, and you're quoting uh, the president of Israel, the prime minister, the defense minister, um, but these are only quotes. I would like to ask you, do you have a written document by the government which a with a clear intent to commit genocide? Do you think that in Rwanda and in Bosnia-Herzegovina any government officials wrote, wrote a document saying, I want to commit genocide? Have you seen anything like that? I'll, I'll answer this for you. No. That's like walking past a guy who's raping a girl and you're like, mm, no, 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 no. Even though I see the rape, but he did not put in writing that he intends to rape her. What the fuck? This refusal to see Israel as an aggressor is so deeply rooted. Like at some point when he was asking her the question, you notice he was just like turning the pen. It's like his body knows the truth, but his mind, the cognitive dissonance just won't let him. You see this like kind of like glazed over look. This is ideological possession. Israel cannot commit crimes. Israel cannot commit crimes. By the way, all the German media now, right, left, center, they're all united in the support of Israel. Living in complete denial of the savagery that Israel commits on a daily basis, not just in Gaza, in the West Bank. Just watch these settlers in the West Bank. Oh my God, this clip. If you have blood pressure medication, I suggest you pop a couple of pills, <laughs> a couple of dozen pills. Settlers come in, kicking a man off his land, and then they call the police and the army, knowing fully well that the army is gonna support them. And what gets me about this clip is the smirk on the face of the settler and the army and how they're just provoking the guy. Oh, where are you from? From Jordan? From, from Egypt? This is his land. <laughs> It's my land. It's my land. You take him from out from here. Here, here the army and they are not doing anything. They are trying to keep me from my land. Where are you from? I'm from Tuan here. This is my own land. What is this? What? It's a Bedouin. You're a Bedouin. You don't know that? You don't know? You are Saudi Arabia. 
Yeah, no, uh, my Jordan. Gra- my grandparents. Yeah. My grandparents. They are yeah, grandparents. From the first year. Yeah. From the first year. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You, 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 you ah, so you're Bedouin from first year. So you, your place you is first year. Your place yes, is first year. Yes, and the land that my grandparents <coughs> are living in after after you evict them from there. And why you evict yeah, them yeah. from there? And I understand. The baro set up twice ago. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. תן להם חמש דקות שילכו. יש לכם חמש דקות, הייתם פה. The German is trying to silence people about criticizing. If you would have seen the pictures that we saw in Berlin in the streets, there were some streets where it looks like in the West Bank. So people could not even, Palestinian people could not even grieve. They could not be angry. They could not have Palestinian flags in their living room. Policemen came to their living rooms and took these uh, flags. Germany is basically following in the footsteps of Israel taking its marching orders from Israel as it arrests and oppresses and silences. I dedicate now this talk to a colleague of mine, Dr. Nadia Shalhuv Kervokian, a Palestinian who lives in East Jerusalem, who is a professor in the Hebrew University, who gave a talk about the splitting of Palestine and the striving for life and how Palestinians are collecting the parts of the bodies of their children in order to bury them. And she was arrested by the police. She was handcuffed. She was detained by the Israeli police. Speaking of piecing your children back together, here's a heartbreaking montage of the, some of the kids in Rafah before the tent massacre. And the woman who was talking to them actually put this montage together saying, I don't know if any of these kids are still alive. <laughs> But let's travel back to Germany, where there's a concerted effort to stop anyone from talking about this genocide. And speaking of these crazy restrictions in Germany, let's move to the Palestine Congress in Berlin that I kind of I teased at the beginning of this video. More than 2,000 police officers were deployed to stop this conference, which was accused of being a hotbed of radical Islam. Before we get to the Palestinians who were stopped from talking at this conference, let's talk about the Jews who were silenced. German authorities froze the bank accounts of the Jewish organization, Jewish Force for a Just Peace in the Middle East, because it was collecting donations and tickets. Freezing bank accounts. This is not North Korea or China or Russia, babe. <laughs> this is Germany. And there's a board member from Jewish Voice for a Just Peace in the Middle East, Udi Raz, a Jewish man, a Jewish Israeli national who lives in Germany, who was arrested. You can see him being dragged with his kippah. And there was another Jew, Andrew Feinstein, who is a former member of the National Assembly of South Africa. He was banned from speaking because the whole conference was stopped. So everybody was prevented from giving their speeches. And he gave his speech on social media, the speech that he was supposed to give. By way of background, I am South African. I'm Jewish. My mother was a Holocaust survivor. She was hidden in a coal cellar for three and a half years. And whenever there was a raid on the area in which she lived, She was rolled up into a carpet that was put up against the wall and hidden behind coal. My mother, when she moved to South Africa with my South African father, arrived in the country and saw that the majority of people, the black South Africans, as they were called by the apartheid state, were treated as subhuman effectively. And she saw in what was happening in apartheid South Africa exactly what had been experienced by European Jews. And the reason this is so important now is because we are seeing the Israeli state, an apartheid state. Israel is in fact a worse apartheid state than was experienced by the majority of South Africans. Because in the South African context, the racist state required the incredibly cheap labor of the black workforce to keep the economy going. Whereas Israel does not have that imperative with the Palestinian people. As a consequence of which, 
They are willing to massacre, quite literally, hundreds of Palestinians every day. Just to make sure that we understand what's happening here, Germany is silencing critical thinking Jews, preventing them from speaking while pretending to fight anti-Semitism. Because here are Jews who oppose the government of Israel. They're here. And you know what they're called in Germany? Anti-Semites. <laughs> That's <laughs> German humor. <laughs> As a commissioner for anti-Semitism in Germany, and he's not a Jew, he's a German. A German commissioner who tells Jews that they're anti-Semites. Listen, I can't write any better jokes than the reality. So basically Germany, as Naomi Klein said, who's also a Jewish American writer and a reporter, she said Germany learned a rule, but not a principle, which means they understand, okay, the rule is don't criticize Israel but not the essence or the core of what's behind that. So they took their fascism and now they're just projecting it on Palestinians. And when the German police shut down the Palestine Congress in Berlin, they were very violent about it and very aggressive. They shut off the electricity in the whole building to prevent a live stream. And just like their muses in fascism, the Zionists, they were hell bent on using violence when they didn't need to. Listen to Yanis talk about his experience at the Congress. One of the young Jewish protesters who had his own little placard which read Jews against genocide was apprehended. At that point, because he is a humorful guy, he said to them, would it have been okay if it read Jews in favor of genocide? At which point they hit him because they got annoyed with him. And he, he ended up in a prison cell. Another small but telling detail, if this was a movie, it would have been a good scene. Uh, they tried to get into the, the room, where uh, the technician's room, where the servers were, supporting the live streaming. And one of our organizers was actually giving them the key to get into that room and they yeah. defused it. And they used uh, force to break down the door instead, even though we were giving them the key. In other words, this was a declaration that they wanted force, they wanted violence, they wanted to create a climate of fear. So all this violence is because they're scared of ideas. Can you imagine? You're shutting down ideas with violence. Now let's move on to the Palestinian who was prevented from speaking, a surgeon who is a UK national, but he's of Palestinian origin. So this morning at 10 o'clock, I landed in Berlin to attend a conference on Palestine where I had been asked, along with many um, others in the UK, in the United States and in Europe, to give my evidence of the 43 days that I had seen in the hospitals in Gaza working in both Shifa and Al-Ahli Hospital. Upon um, arrival, I was stopped at the passport office. I was then escorted down to the basement of the airport where I was questioned for around three and a half hours. At the end of three and a half hours, I was told that I will not be allowed to enter German soil, that I will, and that this ban will last the whole of April. And not just that, that if I were to try to, set, to link up by Zoom or I were to send a video of my lecture to the conference in Berlin, then um, that would constitute a breach of German law and that I would endanger myself uh, to having a fine or even up to a year of prison. Not only did they ban him from entering Germany, they gave him a one-year ban from entering all of Europe. In early May, he was supposed to speak at the French Senate and he was barred from entering at the Charles de Gaulle airport. Thanks, Germany. You know, if Hitler was alive and he saw what Germany and Israel are doing, he'd be like, girl, this is too much. <laughs> this is a lot, <laughs> too much fascism. We need to reel it back in. Speaking of Hitler, the reason the German police gave for stopping the conference is that they were predicting some Holocaust denial was going to go down in those speeches. In this moment, there was also, as I said, a new risk rating, where a high risk prognosticated for it would be there are speeches that, as I said, could be anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic and Holocaust denying. Literally, no one was talking about the Holocaust, babe. The Holocaust is on your mind because you still feel guilty about it. Nobody is talking about the Holocaust. The Holocaust was terrible, but it happened 80 years ago. People are busy trying to seize fire, stop the fire, stop the killing of Palestinians. That's what people are preoccupied with, not the Holocaust. Nobody's denying or even talking about the Holocaust. It's finished. We're trying to stop the killing now. And this obsession with anti-Semitism is just a distraction from the fact that your society is still anti-Semitic today. Um, I don't know how long ago this was. 
there was a he wasn't even right wing he was a conservative politician and uh, there was a scandal around him now it's about a month before state elections in bavaria an important election in a big rich state and of course it's a good time for scandals to come to the surface and the worst ones for anyone in germany especially is ones of anti-semitism and that's what's happening with ivanger who's being accused of distributing anti-semitic pamphlets when he was a schoolboy it was a scandal in germany people would call him anti-Semitic, people would call him a monster, people would say he had to step down, but right now they're taking literal Jews, they're taking people who are protesting in peace, literal Jews, people who are the descendants of survivors of the Holocaust, and then you have this big police state, they take them down. It's so deeply tragic. I have lived this, like in suburban Germany, especially in East Germany, where people have been victimized in a way um, through very, very poor living conditions after the Berlin Wall fell and the Soviet Union went down. It's almost like they're pressuring them to become um, against everything that is different than themselves. Anfeindungen auf der Straße, abwertende Blicke oder abends nicht in den Club kommen, nur weil man nicht weiß ist. In Ostdeutschland scheint das Problem noch krasser zu sein als in Westdeutschland. Irgendwas mit Hundeessen oder Reis oder Xing Shang Shong. Dass wir rausgehen sollen, dass wir uns integrieren sollen und unsere Kopftücher absetzen müssen. Also wir wurden auf jeden Fall angeschrien, auch angespuckt. And that's probably the one big thing you have to understand about German society as well as Israeli as society right now, it's not the baddies that are the bad, it's the normal people that are the bad. Basically, racism and dehumanization has to happen in order to remain safe and secure. That's what the police always say. We're just doing our jobs. That's what they do, did in the concentration and death camps. They were just doing their job. And they're going to tell you in your face in 20 years, if this is going to escalate any further in Germany, in Gaza, around the world, they're still telling you in your face, I was just doing my job. I told you also before that um, my father was working as a doctor in the house of Rostock Lichtenhagen. It was the biggest program after um, the Soviet Union fell in Germany, which was where a big mob of just normal civilians, of German civilians, burned down, not like a refugee home, but a home, like uh, an apartment complex where there were many people, I think, from Vietnam. And police never did anything against it. They were there. They were just looking at it. It was burning down. You know, and we have all of this in our collective consciousness. And I think we don't even just have it there on a literal way. We have it embodied. I love this expression, embodied pain. When the pain just becomes part of your subconscious, when it just lives in your cells and your body, even though you're not thinking about it, because you can go on and say, oh, I'm, I'm not interested in any of this, but actually lives inside you. Eckhart Tolle also talks about the pain body, you know, all the accumulated unresolved pain that just sits there and piles on top of each other. And there's a lot of pain that is being accumulated from witnessing this and even ignoring this. And again, this is not to shame people for not going out in the street and protesting, but it's not normal for us human beings to know that this much violence is being inflicted on another human being and be okay with it. We can ignore it, but it sits somewhere inside us. And that's what I love about Sophia's thinking because we really match in that way of thinking. Many um, politically active people around me um, when it first started and people were actively outraged against the brutality, which I have to admit right now, it's not easy anymore to be as outraged every single day, even though it's getting worse and worse and worse um, because of compassion fatigue. Speaking of compassion fatigue, I really experienced that when I saw the video of the father carrying the decapitated baby 
at the Rafah tent massacre. I was telling my therapist last month that what I'm kind of proud of this time is I'm able to witness the pain of Palestine and cry about it, unlike previous times where I would just get angry and be kind of like numb and frozen. But when I saw that image of the father carrying the decapitated baby, I froze. I went back to that inability to cry. That's why I hate seeing stuff like this. Because for me, maybe some people who need to see this are the people who are actively ignoring Palestine. But if you already feel for it, you don't need to see the images of violence. But you need to stay connected somehow to just bear witness to it. Like, I, I've been talking with a friend of mine about the idea that I am having flash forwards right now. You know, in PTSD, you normally have flashbacks. But now with all of the images, all of the political environments changing, like maybe even, I think five to 10 times a day, I have flash forwards. Like I, I see, I see my child, and I see my child like not having any limbs anymore. You know what I mean? I see like all the escalation That's that dark, is Sophia. happening around me. <laughs> no, I, I'm sorry, it's actually happening like that. It's yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I see myself being in jail because I'm just speaking up about political stuff that was just completely normal a couple of years ago. <laughs> I don't want to have like any gruesome fantasy right now. It's just what's happening in my day-to-day -day life that I have these interruptions of mind. It's not yeah. anxiety in a kind because I know how an anxiety feels. Yeah, in indeed. When, when anxiety becomes pathological or when people have panic disorder, the fear is usually very irrational. So you can see, come on now, this is not happening. But I'm trying to find a way to comfort you. But then as I listen to you, I'm like, yeah, uh, these are all possibilities. <laughs> yeah, know? that's true. Yeah, are you are you scared in any way because of your activism? Yeah, uh, I could, but <laughs> there's like two sides to it, and um, I don't know if you actually saw the speech of Varoufakis. Give me Donald Trump anytime. Give me a fascist. <laughs> Seriously, you know, I want to see the enemy uh, to look, who stares at me and says, you know you shouldn't have the right to exist, I'm going to wipe you out. Uh, th 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 that, you know, I can handle that. I cannot handle comrades who are um, out of spinelessness. They, they crave the appreciation of the people who are complicit in the genocide of Palestinians. And that's exactly what I feel right now, because I'm in more danger at least for the next couple of months until there's elections. After the elections, I will probably be more in more danger because of the right wings. But um, but the right now you're scared Germany, of whom? That's uh, that's the satire almost in Germany. I'm more scared right now of uh, the left wing, or even let's just say the progressives in Germany. Because we have what are called anti-Deutsche. These anti-Deutsche activists, they're also so unintentionally funny. It's like the liberal Zionists. It's, they're very comical characters. They walk around wrapped in Israeli flags, hardcore Zionists, progressives, leftists in Germany. And they're just scanning everything through the filter of anti-Semitism. And they take everything that happened to Jews in Germany before as kind of like their guiding light. And they're just searching for anti-Semitism. It's insane. And Sophia was at a protest in Dresden for Palestine. And these anti-Deutsche activists, they were taking pictures of all the protesters. Now there's a rule, there's kind of like a code of honor. When you take pictures of protesters, you blur out their faces. They do it to protect these protesters because a lot of them are asylum seekers and they don't want to get into trouble. So that's what the leftists and progressives historically would always do. Now the right-wingers would always take pictures of everyone. Just, but you would expect that. But these anti-Deutsche, like leftist progressive people, what they were doing at the protest that Sofia attended in Dresden is they would take pictures of all the protesters, but they would only blur out the faces of the Jewish protesters to protect them. But they would publish the faces of the others because for them to be accused of anti-Semitism is the worst thing in the world. Which is, of course, it's bad, but you should extend that to all other minorities. You know, these progressives are the worst because they're in complete denial that their oppression of Muslims today has exactly the same way they oppressed the Jews before, but they just can't see it. Liberals are the worst. When they're backed up, oh, I cannot. Give me a right winger any day, because at least I know what I'm dealing with. But these people who think they're open-minded, but they're actually bigots? No, vomit, 
As Israel continues to subject besieged Gaza to a brutal bombing campaign, Western governments have lined up in support of Israel. No country, though, seems to have aligned itself as unequivocally with Israel than Germany. Some of the harshest like, repressions took place um, last week happened here, and they closed that street and um, they built some sort of desk to process the people. One of the people processed at these desks was sociologist Matanya. They just drove me two blocks and dropped me off over there where they created a pop-up police station. They like really put down tables and everything because they were arresting so many people that day. Women, men, 10-year-old kids. After me, a 10-year-old boy got arrested, worked to the floor, sat on his neck. Actually, I think why this war is, go is as big as it is in Europe, because they see future refugees. It's almost like Egypt who's saying, no, we're not going to take any because they see future refugees. You have to go into the mind of a person that has um, put their emotions deep, 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 deep down. They're dehumanized. Even in, every, in the heads of every normal German people, Jews have been dehumanized. Black people have been dehumanized, and now everyone that's coded as being a Muslim. The one thing I had like a, an epiphany, like a eureka moment, when I was watching the media in Germany, it was like one of the neutral ones, like I mentioned, and they had the Palestine Congress, and then they had um, the German government talking about um, a debit card for refugees, which is basically like a payback card, like they will scan everything they do. Da beginnen wir bei der Bezahlkarte für Geflüchtete und Asylbewerber. Da hat der Bundestag eine bundeseinheitliche Rechtsgrundlage für die Einführung beschlossen. And they can only pay with this card. And they can only pay in their surroundings. So they're not even allowed to go from Berlin to Hamburg, from Berlin to Cologne. It's not possible. And Every person who's dumb enough to think that this is going to happen only to refugees. There was a single second of irony when a right-wing politician said, okay, what about doing that to the people who are on um, like social welfare? Why are not we not doing that for them? And then everyone was like, you're not going to tell. We will, you're we will, just wait. Just yeah, wait. yeah, yeah. <laughs> If you think banning the Efficacy for Palestine will be the last thing. You better think twice. They will yeah. ban everything that is progressive. Yeah. I'm not talking about banning like being shadow banned. I'm talking about banning like you're not able to leave this city. You're not able to pay without this card. And most likely, which is something I cannot get into my heart. Sophia, we made First. a deal. We were not going to manifest. We're just going to... This is a good moment to be in denial. I support yeah. in denial in this moment. La, 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 la. Maybe a lot of the stuff that we imagine is true, but maybe it's best not to go to that. that uh, I don't think so. We can, we can disagree civilly here. I think <laughs> that what we have, if you look around every single advocate that is actually reaching people, be it our favorite Finkelstein, for example, what we have to do is we have to be easily wounded by being so open. That I will not be silent when Israel commits its crimes against the Palestinians. If you had any heart in you, you would be crying for the Palestinians. We cannot allow our surroundings to make us hard. And that is one of the things why I am so enraged by local politicians and everyone who's just trying to ignore or downsize the Palestinian cause is because they are downsizing their own humanity. Yeah. The way they feel the sadness, the way they feel the shame. Basically suppressing the pain so you don't have to feel it. You said, oh, don't think about that. Don't talk about it. It's so, it's so dark, but you have to offer a part of your own sanity in order to do that. Like, 
I, 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 I yeah. always wanted to be a mother. There's not one thing I wanted to do more than being a mother. But having this conflict, the just primal sense of fear for my children has become so much more complicated. Because I have to think about what is going to happen if only, not, not like the worst kind of escalation, but if only I go to a demonstration and police will just keep us there, keep the parents. Do you think they care about the children? I've seen, in, when I was living in Austria, I've seen a refugee mother being um, separated Separation. and she had like a one or two year old daughter in the bus. Like they took her out because she didn't have the papers and they left the one or two year old um, child with me in the bus. I didn't know them. They even left her phone there. So there was like a two year old <sighs> child on the bus. And when I told them that they please just take this child from me because this is the mother, this child is obviously like in the in the biggest fear they could imagine because it's a strange place, strange situation. There's police with all of this, you know, police, all of this armor, and they're taking the mother and they're leaving the phone. Like, they wouldn't care. I don't know this what was happened. What, this was what, to, to interrogate the mother or? Um, because they, she didn't have the papers to like legally, they didn't, they didn't have a visa or something. They were refugees, you know, like illegal refugees. What happened to this child then? I don't know. When I talk about flash forwards, I talk about the actual everyday situations that are happening to racialized people in this country right now. And those are going to get worse with the, with the coming government and everyone in the global society should shame Germany for the way they're um, trying to prohibit uh, humane life for refugees in Germany. And this is why they also try to ban the uh, advocacy for Palestine. Right. And I thought about it before. It's like, it's like the bombs they drop on the Palestinians, the phosphor bombs. Mm -hmm. The more you try to um, get the fire down, the more it's going to burn harder afterwards. It's going to be so hard, the Palestinian cause, that this kind of repression is never going to hurt it. <laughs> This anger is healthy. We can use it in all form of protesting, not just going on the street, but art, in the way we communicate with other people, just acknowledging that the anger you feel is there. And we're supposed to feel anger in the face of brutal terror as it's inflicted on defenseless people. Because the more robotic and numb those aggressors and oppressors have to be, because they do have to be, by the way, very numb, they have to shut off their feelings in order to inflict such pain. So the more robotic they become, we need to be more in our feelings and not run away from our feelings. And when I say robotic, I mean, literally, they're killing with AI, but also robotic on another level where you're just pretending that what you're doing to Palestinians is okay. Those are almost robotic people. We have to have every single one of these facets of emotion and emotional integrity and embodiment to be the best. And this is what Palestinians in Gaza are teaching us with their pain, with this like inconceivable amount of pain, if we dare to look. Uh, الست شهور هاي يعني كانت كتير كتير صعبة انت بتحكي فقدت عيلتي فقدت اصحابي فقدت اولادي ذكريات بتمر عياد ميلاد بتمر حياة بتمر طلعت طلعت من غزة جيت على تركيا عالجت زوجتي وما زلت بعالجها ولكن الاشي المؤلم إنه أنت بتكوني بتكون فاق يعني فاقد الأولاد وفاقد الأخوة وفاقد الكل. So if you really put yourself in the shoes of this man emotionally, your heart will shatter into a million little pieces. So I get why people would not want to go there. But even if you decide to consciously look away, the pain in your heart is there. 
And what we see with Zionists, like we saw with German soldiers before, um, they're going to pay the price later. Like, because they have to feel this kind of change. There cannot be an occupation that will be moral or that, you know, will conduct itself in a good way. It's, the, you know, the problem is inherent in, in the mission. And the mission is occupying people without, without them having rights and dignity. One issue was this issue of settler violence. Uh, which is not really discussed within Israeli society and what I saw through my view from the operations room was time and again how acts of violence against Palestinians are just under rug swept and, um, and covered up by the military. Inevitably it will end because like all other you know oppressive regimes and undemocratic regimes they fail to sustain you know be sustainable and, and I think deeply as long as Palestinians don't have security we're not going to have security. This is how the human conscience is supposed to work because we are people with a heart and we're people with an electric heart field. We feel everyone's hearts around them. If my baby is sleeping next to me in in my bed, it's going to be thriving much more other than if it were sleeping in another room across the floor. You know, we have to have these tiny humane parts of ourselves that we have to gather and we have to cling on to them because we cannot be broken. Everyone understands that the system is broken and that's the critical first step in trying to change it. There are people all over the world who had never heard of Palestine before October 7th and now they're engaged politically in this campaign more than ever before. So my call to you here, we have to go from here emboldened. Re-emboldened that we will go into every community, every street, every school, every workplace with the call to free Palestine and end the Zionist settler colonial project. It's over. It is over. Tragically, at an enormous cost to the Palestinian people, but it is over. Yeah.